What is going on guys? This is Arctic Fox. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are looking at the missing persons case of Jody Sue Husentruitt who went missing out of Mason City, Iowa on the 27th of June 1995. She was 27 years old at the time of her disappearance and she would be around 56 years old today. Jody was a news anchor for KIMT in Mason City, and she disappeared in the early morning hours of the 27th of June, 1995, soon after telling a colleague that she had overslept and was running late for work. There were signs of struggle outside of her apartment, and she's believed to have been abducted. However, extensive investigations have failed to uncover any materialistic clues as to what happened in her disappearance. Jody would be declared legally dead in 2001. She was raised in Long Prairie, Minnesota, the youngest daughter of Maurice Nicholas Husentruit and Ima Jean Husentruit. Um, she excelled at golf in high school and won the state class A tournament along with her team in 1985 and 1986. After high school, Jody enrolled at the St. Cloud State University where she studied mass communications and speech communication, graduating with a bachelor's degree in 1990. Her first job after graduation was with Northwest Airlines. Jody began her broadcasting career with CBS affiliate KGAN in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, as the station's Iowa City Bureau Chief, and then returned to Minnesota for a job at an ABC affiliate KSAX in Alexandria. Jody later returned to Iowa for her position at CBS affiliate KIMT in Mason City. Now, the day before Jody disappeared, she participated in a golf tournament, according to Mason City resident John Van Sice. And keep that name, kind of put a pin in it, because it's going to be important to this case. She then went to John Van Sice's house to view a videotape of a birthday celebration that John had arranged for her earlier that month. At around 4 a.m. on the 27th of June, 1995, KIMT producer Amy Coons announced that or noticed that Jody had failed to report to work as scheduled, so she called the apartment. When Jody answered the phone, she explained that she had overslept and that she was preparing to leave for the station. However, by 6 a.m., Jody still had not arrived, so the producer filled in for her on the morning show, Daybreak. At about 7 a.m., the staff called the Mason City Police because Jody was pretty punctual and it was very out of character for her to ever miss a show. And when the police did arrive at Jody's apartment, they found her red Mazda Miata in the parking lot that she was planning on buying, as well as evidence that suggested a struggle had taken place near the car. Her personal items, including a bent car key and her red high heels, as well as a hair dryer and other things strewn around the parking lot, uh, were recovered by police. And police reported uh, recovering an unidentified palm print from her vehicle. Now, investigators in interviewed at least three neighbors at Jody's apartment complex who said that they had heard screams around the time that she likely would have been leaving for work. In addition, a nearby neighbor reported seeing a white Ford Econoline idling in the parking lot at about the same time. In September of 1995, the Hughes and Truett family hired private investigators from McCarthy and Associates Investigative Services, Incorporated. Um, who in turn enlisted the assistance of Omaha, Nebraska private investigator Doug McCarthy. Um, McCarthy, I'm sorry, um, who in turn were working with private investigator Doug Jasa. 
Now, McCarthy and Jason, they have appeared on several television shows, including America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. In November of 1995, they and members of Jody's family traveled to Los Angeles to meet with three prominent psychics. This meeting was televised and served as the pilot for the Psychic Detectives television show. Although each show generated several leads, none have resulted in any concrete evidence or identification of a suspect. In May of 1996, about 100 volunteers searched an area of Cerro Gordo County and left flags to mark anything that appeared suspicious. Each of these sites was then re-examined by law enforcement, but no promising evidence was ever located. Police and private investigators through the years have conducted more than a thousand interviews, but none have resulted in conclusive evidence pointing to a suspect. Jody was declared legally dead in May of 2001. In 2003, FindJody.com was created by Minnesota television journalists Josh Benson and Gary Peterson with the goal to keep the case in the spotlight and for the website to serve as a clearinghouse for tips that could lead to finding Jody. When new cases arise that appear to have similarities to Jody's or whenever remains are discovered in the area, speculation quickly leads to a connection with the missing reporter. However, no suspect has been identified and all uncovered remains to date have been proven to be from other sources. In 2005, many media outlets, including 2020, again focused on the story as the 10th anniversary of Jody's disappearance approached. In early June of 2008, photocopies of the 84 pages of Jody's personal journal were anonymously mailed to a local newspaper. The Mason City Globe Gazette received the material in a large envelope with no return address and a June 4th postmark from Waterloo. The original journal had been in the possession of law enforcement since the investigation began. Within days, Mason City Police reported that the sender had come forward and identified as the wife of the former Mason City Police Chief. Although, noting that the former chief had taken a copy of the journal home when he left office, the police gave no motive as to why the woman had sent it to the newspaper. In May of 2015, all 100 members of the Iowa House of Representatives signed a letter requesting Mason City to declare the 27th of June, 2015 as jo Jody Husenturet Day in honor of her memory and that of all victims in unsolved cases. This was ultimately declined. In December of 2016, an opinion piece for the Northwest Iowa Review uh, Retiring State Representative John Cookier of Sioux City described his experience with the case as a member of the Iowa State House Public Safety Committee and suggested a cover-up by Mason City officials. In March of 2017, a search warrant was executed against a person of interest, John Van Sice, who, who we talked about earlier. And they also wanted to get data from two of his vehicles. Since 2019, private investigator Steve Ridge has been investigating the case. And as of 2020, the Mason City Police and the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation are all still actively investigating Jody's disappearance. That same year, FindJody.com launched a podcast by the same name in order to gain a new audience to share information on the case and generate new leads. In 2022, ABC's 2020 debuted a special titled Gone at Dawn, overviewing the disappearance and interviewing those close with the case. This episode was the third time 2020 featured Jody's case. In 2023, the private investigator Ridge offered $25,000 for information on Jody's disappearance, doubling the total reward to $50,000, and I have seen that that reward is now at $100,000. Uh, Ridge said that the offer has the blessing of Jody's sister, and this reward does not require an arrest or conviction, but simply the recover of Jody's remains. In 2024, Mason City Police searched a site in Winstead, Minnesota, 
currently being used for apartment construction after the submission of an anonymous tip. And I want to go over that information with you too because this is the newest information that we have in Jody's case. So apparently someone ha had called in a tip relating to Jody's case. Um, and so they, they worked to, to follow up on this tip as quickly as possible. Um, they are continuing to receive, evaluate, and follow up on information it receives related to Jody's disappearance on a regular basis. Information from this effort should be used in the ongoing investigation at this time. They really haven't released a lot of information other than this tip that has led them to the search site. Um, and again, I feel for this family. Jody's mother has passed away, so she's not going to be able to see any type of justice for her daughter. Uh, we've gone over most of the information in this case, but there's been a lot of things actually transpire throughout the years that I do want to talk about. Jody's friends had thought that possibly Jody, um, Jody's friend, John Van Sice, was responsible um, because of the way he kind of looked at her and things throughout the years. Um, Jody herself felt as though she may have been being followed and she was actually looking to try to get out of Mason City and go back home and get a job there. Um, so there's a lot to this, guys. Again, when they searched the crime scene, which is also a big question because there's people out there say, that say that the crime scene was never properly taped off and that Jody's car was almost immediately uh, released to her, her family. Uh, but they would find her red pumps, a bottle of hairspray, her blow dryer, earrings, along with a bent car key. All of this was just surrounding the car, and it reflected that a struggle had definitely taken place. Um, they did do a sweep of her apartment, the parking lot, and the river that was nearby, but early on, they they believed foul play in the case. Um, there were canine units brought out. They searched a two-mile area of the Winnebago River that runs through a park near Jody's apartment on Kentucky Avenue, uh, they did discover items of clothing along the riverbanks, but they were never able to determine if these belonged to Jody. Uh, investigators did impound her Miata and lifted a unidentified palm print off the car. Uh, but again, that Miata, it's unclear from what I've been looking into if it was all ever properly secured as a crime scene and also how quickly it was released back to Jody's family. Which is ironic that it was released back to her family because there's a lot of speculation. Now, I don't have definitive proof, but the, the locals say that Jody was actually buying that Mazda Miata from John Van Sice and that it wasn't actually in her name. Now, I haven't been able to find anything that points to that conclusively, so take that with a grain of salt. Police did learn that some residents had heard noises like an animal the morning that Jody vanished, but of course that later turned into people having heard screams. Uh, they believe that Jody was screaming as she was dragged down the center of the parking bumpers uh, by her car. Uh, there were heel marks in the dirt of the pavement. Neighbors also reported seeing that white van in the parking lot with its parking lights on, and John Van Sice did have a white truck at the time, so it is possible, in my opinion, that it could have been mistaken for a van. Uh, a friend of Jody's alleged that the, the police did not immediately tape off the crime scene, which could have resulted in contamination of evidence being overlooked. It, uh, well, it could have resulted in contamination of evidence or evidence being overlooked. And again, Jody's car was released to her parents shortly after the disappearance instead of being kept as evidence. Now, there's a police chief, uh, Jeff Brinkley. He was asked if he thought the car was released in haste, and he said maybe. He said they don't have it, 
and they just have to live with what they've got and try to do as good as they can with that. Now, Brinkley is the fourth police chief to have Jody's case under his command. But there's a lot of unanswered questions in the case. Um, Mason City Police Officer Terrence Prochaska took over the case in 2010. And he says he asks what caused her to sleep in that day. What caused her to answer the phone and rush to work? What was she doing the night before? And he says they want to know all the fine details. They want to know where she was at. She was golfing. So, has she driven home and made a phone call to her friend? Yes, those are facts. But it's a gray area in between that they don't quite understand at this time. While attending the after-work golf tournament, Jody reportedly told friends that she'd been receiving prank phone calls and that she was thinking of going to the police and changing her numbers. Now, John Van Sice is 22 years older than Jody and was the last person to have seen her. Now, John Van Sice claims that Jody was like a daughter to him, like his own child. Uh, friends of Jody's suspected that John Van Sice may have been involved in her abduction. However, a friend of John Van Sice has claimed that she called him at 6 a.m. that morning wanting to go for a walk, and when they met later that morning, uh, John apparently didn't seem anxious or out of sorts. John also passed a polygraph test, but you know how I feel about polygraphs, but he did pass one. He's never been named an official suspect, but again, in March of 2017, search warrants were issued for the GPS records of John's 1999 Honda Civic and 2013 GMC 1500. It was the most substantial break in the case in decades, but... To the, the, the disappointment of investigators and those of us who have followed this case for years, there was nothing of importance recovered. And John Van Sice is up in age now. He has Alzheimer's disease, or did as of the last time I saw him on TV. And so the chances of him being able to provide any information, even if he were to decide to step forward are slim to none. The case has never been closed. It's never been a closed case. It's been an active investigation ever since it happened, according to law enforcement. Uh, but law enforcement says they have to be objective and they have to keep an open mind. Um, and it's important to remember that it could be someone responsible that none of us would have ever thought of. The weekend before she disappeared, she had gone water skiing with John Van Sice and a couple of friends. And in her June 25th, 1995 diary entry, she wrote that she had gone, got home from a weekend trip to Iowa City. And it was fun. Uh, it was wild, far, wild partying and water skiing. I said that she had skied to Coralville Reserve. Uh, said that she was improving on the skis. Um... And uh, John's son, Trent, had given her some great ski tip advice. In one of her last entries, she wrote, Great friends, but professionally, I'm fed up. It's difficult finding a new job, and I'm confused about agent and what to do. In November of 2019, investigator Steve Ridge revealed that while skiing with John Van Sice, Jody also boarded a Mastercraft ski boat with two younger men that she had met that same weekend. He told local press that he had spoke to the two witnesses who were at the lake that Saturday in 1995. Those witnesses said that John Van Sice was not very enthused that Jody had left to spend time with the younger men, but he did not overreact or cause a scene. Uh, the investigator went on to say that once Jody and a female friend boarded the other men's boats, they were seen drinking and dancing on the boat deck, and also said that the owner of the boat took a video of them which had been given to the Mason City Police investigators. Investigator Ridge investigated whether one or both of the young men may have visited Jody the following day or Monday, the night that she was abducted, stating that it was conceivable that a confrontation occurred that would shed light on a motive for Jody's abduction. 
a lot of unfortunate things came together in a relatively short period of time, it would seem, just before Jody went missing. Although, Investigator Ridge is an independent investigator, he has worked with law enforcement and forwarded them, forwarded them all the information that he's accumulated in Jody's case. The most bizarre thing happened in 2011, when the Globe Gazette reported that a former Mason City police officer, Maria Ohl, had accused two fellow officers and a retired Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation agent of being involved in Jody's abduction and murder. Ohl was a 10-year veteran and said that she had received credible information from an informant in 2007 and again in 2009 who implicated Lieutenant Frank Stearns, Lieutenant Ron Van Weird, and Bill Bassler in the abduction. Al said that she told her superiors, but heard nothing in response. She also said that she was terminated due to her handling of Jody's case information. It's horrifically disturbing, she said. They're still working on the taxpayer's dollar. Um... Al would be put on administrative leave and ultimately terminated. Joshua Benson, an evening anchor at an Orlando ABC affiliate who founded FindJody.com, said that Al had confided in him as well, but he was unable to find any information that, that could prove her claims. When the complaint was filed, an official investigation found no validity in these allegations. So, another crazy thing would happen on New Year's Eve of 2020 when vandals defaced a billboard of the missing anchor woman in Mason City, Iowa. The billboard is among three in Mason City that show a picture of Jody along with the text, Somebody Knows Something, Is It You?, Underneath this question, the vandals sprayed in bright yellow paint the cryptic words Frank Stern's Machine Shed across the bottom half of the billboard. Frank Stearns was the longtime detective with the Mason City Police Department who diligently worked on Jody's case, and he is now retired. Now, um, he is a, a death scene investigator, but he's no longer involved with Jody's case. Uh, Steve Ridge said that he believed how and when the billboard was vandalized. He said two individuals dressed in black parked near the rear alley behind a tattoo parlor and erected an aluminum ladder against the wall at 11.30 p.m. on the 31st of December 2019. While one held the ladder, the other spray-painted Frank Stearns in large letters and machine shed in smaller print below. He said that the parking lot of the nearby bar was full and dozens of cars passed right below the billboard while the individuals were vandalizing it. Now, he said that he spoke to Frank Stearns at his residence in the January of 2020. His rural residence does, not, does have a detached building on the premises, but he lived elsewhere in 1995. While the billboard vandals surely meant to dredge up old wounds and accusations, Frank Stearns remains a respected community member and said that he hopes that they are found and punished for, for what they did. In 2023, Steve Ridge revealed the existence of a mystery man, someone previously unknown to the public who Jody met 10 days before she disappeared. They became fast friends and allegedly saw each other eight times in this short window, and their intense sudden relationship may have caused jealous rifts, especially with, uh, in my opinion, John Van Size. Again, Jody was born in June of 1968 and raised in the small town of Long Prairie, Minnesota. She was the youngest daughter of Maurice Hughes and Truett and her mother, Ima Jean Anderson Hughes and Truett. In high school, she was very popular, she was well-liked, she excelled at golf, and again, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1990. Um, and that's basically what we know about the investigation. Uh, we do not know what, if anything, of significance was recovered during this most recent search that occurred. 
uh, if I do get any information as to any new information about what was recovered, I will put that in the description box of this video or I'll do an update. But it's been far too long. I mean, we're talking about basically 30 years that jody has been missing. Her family has had her declared deceased. There's definitely foul play involved given the scene and what it looked like. At the time that she went missing, Jody was five foot three inches tall and weighed 120 pounds with blonde hair. And again, you know, her mother's already passed away. So the the problem is is that you know the people that mattered the most when you have a case this old as well as the suspects, because uh, John Van Sys is also very well up in years, uh, they're going to begin to pass away before someone can be held accountable and before they can see justice for, for Jody. Um, if you do have information on Jody or her whereabouts, you can contact the Mason City Police Department at 515 421 3636. Uh, or you can contact the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. office at 641-324-3000. Guys, do me a huge favor. Smash that like button. Get Jody's face all over YouTube. Someone knows something, especially after all these years. The more people that see this, hear the story, although this is one that has been fairly well publicized, there are still people that haven't heard Jody's story. Someone needs to step forward with information. Also, share this out to your social media. Share this to your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, wherever you have social media. It only takes a moment of your time to do, and it can make all the difference in the world in whether we're able to find Jody and bring her home or not. As always, guys, I do want to thank you so much for tuning in and watching. I appreciate each and every single one of you. Y'all be kind to one another out there, and let's bring answers to Jody's family.